You don't have to struggle with your body. There is this, just this, this whole other experience on the other side. And yes, it takes hard work. It takes discipline. But when that all comes from a true place of self-compassion, the transformation is inevitable and everybody can, anybody can do it. Hi, ladies. Welcome back to another episode. We're thrilled to have you here. We hope you enjoyed our previous episodes all about carbs. Today, we are talking about rising above fit shaming, a very hot topic that we unfortunately see time and time again in our practice. And we just really felt a need to talk to our listeners, to our community about some of the things that are happening, especially in this phase of life where we set these fitness, fat loss, running goals, self-care. We don't want to lose the ability to feel, look, or run our best. It means the world to us. So what are these things that people are saying to us? What are things that we're hearing online that really sort of shame us for wanting these things? And what can we do to focus on the good and continuing to take the right steps forward so that we can show up at our highest level? Because we should never be put down for wanting to be the best version of ourselves, whatever that means to you. But before we get into this episode, I do want to just share that we do have a new mini course on our website. We have gotten amazing feedback from it. It's called All About Gut Health and How to Restore It. So we redid this masterclass that we had in our program with updated science, new best practices based on what we see effective for women. And so if you're wondering about gut health, what are different symptoms, um, how does it impact perimenopause, fitness, fat loss, performance, we talk about all of these goals that the women that we coach set and how we help you to optimize your gut health, understand what it is, how to protect it. And then let's say you are suffering with digestive symptoms, different infections like H. pylori, candida. How do you actually effectively restore your gut health with sustainable success? So hop on over to breakingthroughwellness.com. Check out that mini course. We just want to make sure you're up to date with all of our new resources, especially when so many women are sharing that they loved it. So with that, let's get into today's episode. Ariel, you are back with us today. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. I am so excited about this topic today. I think we have a lot of juicy stuff we're going to get into. So, and maybe even a perspective that some people haven't thought about in this arena. Yeah. So many lessons learned from just coaching everyday real women, like going through this. I know we've all gone, th gone through fit shaming ourselves in our own individual ways, but, you know, it doesn't depend on our size. It doesn't depend on how fit we are. If we are trying to eat well or exercise, it is amazing the things people say to us. But I actually want to start with one that is so close to my heart. And rather than getting feisty online when I see this type of information posted, you know, negatively commenting or being argumentative and rude on other practitioners' posts, I want to talk about something that I'm seeing online. This idea that women runners should not try to lose weight. It drives me up a wall because I don't know a single recreational woman runner who doesn't want to look her best and feel her best. And if she's got extra pounds that are on her joints, that doesn't feel good. If she's got unexpected perimenopausal weight gain, heck yeah, she doesn't want that. No woman wants that. So to act like women runners should not ever want to try and lose weight, it drives <laughs> me up a wall. I know, Ariel, you see this too. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, what I have really had a hard time wrapping my brain around, and this is kind of in that whole body positivity movement space, is this idea that we basically cannot love or want more out of our body while simultaneously appreciating it and where it's at. And, and on top of that, it's like, I'm not sure how body positivity got intertwined with eating ultra processed foods and not moving our bodies and not being allowed to feel good in what we wear. And it's just like this warped reality where it's okay to go to your doctor and get a medical weight loss prescription and then eat crap food. And you don't get any comments around that, but you're a female runner and you want to optimize your performance, your health, your longevity, your body composition. And somehow you're shamed for that. Like we're supposed to be shamed for having a vision of ourselves where we can really embody that confident self. And here's the thing. 
when we truly do align our nutrition with natural law, in other words, with what the what we are supposed to be eating, what the earth is providing, we have healthy habits, we have the right mindset, and we have the right movement in place, our bodies will get to that beautiful expression of themselves that is unique to the individual. And I think that's where things get lost is that People think of it's like, well, it's about achieving the specific image of a runner. And the image of a runner is not defined, right? It's like this no idea one wants to that look like those looks... pros. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. <laughs> I, I don't want to be that like unthin that thin and unhealthy is my point. Not that they don't right, you know, right. they're amazing people, but there is yeah. like some yes. serious stuff going on, you know, with very unhealthy low weight as well. So Right, right, right. And that is not at all what we are encouraging. Yeah. And what we are encouraging is fueling the right way for your body as you're in perimenopause and menopause so that you can look, feel and perform your best without carrying around an extra 10 to 20 pounds. And I'm sorry, but the sports nutrition guidelines I was trained in are not what I'm going to be utilizing with our ladies at Breaking Through Wellness because that is not going to take them closer to their goals for performance or body composition. And that would truly be doing them a disservice. I mean, I know Louise, you or we've, shall I say, had some ladies come into the program who have been kind of led astray and really let down by working with other coaches that basically don't make it a safe space for them to want to feel and look good. Yeah. Yeah. We, we kind of joke that we have a recovery program for running coaching <laughs> nutrition programs because <laughs> honestly, it's like you fuel your body to perform, but then you don't take into the account the body composition and the fact mm -hmm. that estrogen is declining. And no, you can't give someone 90 grams of carbs per hour. I'm sorry. A recreational <laughs> runner is not going to do okay with that. <laughs> like that's just, no, no, that, no. And it's, it's just unfortunate to not think about the different elements that happen with a woman's body as it's changing. And unfortunately, I think it's a lot of mis, um, lack of education around this topic. And it's hard to, when we're, you know, innovators on the opposite side of the spectrum as industry leaders, like we can see the strategies that do help protect metabolism and energy and lean body composition and performance while losing weight. And honestly, mm -hmm. in this space, this is largely part of my mission. Like I'm going to a scientific conference this weekend and I am standing in front of my peers and sports medicine colleagues and scientists and sharing the innovative methods of breaking through wellness because there are recreational active women, like triathletes, runners, <laughs> we want to lose weight. We love health and fitness and we should be able to safe and effectively lose weight. I'm actually contributing to a worldwide textbook for science-based practitioners, for other health and fitness professionals, educating them that yes, a, I actually coached a woman who was, she was obese, she was struggling and she wanted to lose weight while running ultra marathons. You know, not really recognizing that the ultra marathon was not the method to lose the weight. So then mm -hmm. she became, she was so passionate about running and it was like, oh my gosh, gosh, we have to make sure you're fueling appropriately, but then still add in fat loss strategies. And when I wrote my, you know, little case testimonial for this science-based textbook, the author, he's like the head of the World Obesity Center was like, wait, what? There are people who are like hyperactive who want to lose weight. And I was like, yeah, I work with them all the time. Like this is what this is my <laughs> zone of genius. Yes. There are runners who are overweight who want to lose weight like this. They love running. Like, I don't know why is this like such a like new novel idea for people. It drives me up a wall. It drives me up a freaking wall. Like I've been there, done that. I was the overweight runner, had to design the methods not to destroy my metabolism and health along the way. Ah, uh, there is a right way to do it, people. Come on. Absolutely. And I want to ask you something, Louise. So what was your experience with your body and your health and food when you were an overweight runner? How did that feel for you? Um, it was so confusing. I mean, that's why I went into my line of work because I couldn't find the answers it you know there's always like a weight watchers program or a super low calorie program well that's not accommodating for an active woman and our fueling needs like we still have to fuel around a fitness session and then i went into like the best sports nutrition textbooks i could find because again this has been like a 20-year journey trying to figure out my own shit so <laughs> i'm going into the research and then i'm seeing guidelines like oh just take away 300 calories per day and that'll add up and i'm like oh that makes sense 
Just don't take it away from the exercise session. No, that didn't work. Staying too low calorie all the time ultimately drains our hormones further, damages our metabolism. So, you know, and then trying to ask other professionals about this. And then they're like, no, you shouldn't be trying to lose weight and run well. Like, what? No, I want both. Go ahead. What do you got? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so loving what you're saying right now because I think this is such a great reflection of how we have such an, an inability to see the gray. You know, it's like weight loss is bad or weight loss is good or, you know, it's, it's this like there is a gray zone and you are allowed and you can optimize your health and your body composition and lose weight from a place of self-care and compassion just because you have, you know, uh, just because you have goals that may exceed the average. And I'm sorry, if your goal is the average, that is fine. But if you want to excel above the average and you want to feel amazing in your skin and you want to lose weight, there is a healthy way to go about it. And I think what's happened is diet culture has really seeped its way into fitness culture in the sense of we have women who are athletes who are following all these crazy programs and protocols because they don't have, you know, a foundation of what we, we have in our community where we can actually help guide them not only to their best performance, but their best body composition. And that's not determined by us weighing and measuring them. That's determined by them implementing the habits and behaviors we know will allow them to thrive. And that body composition is just the outcome of that. And that's the difference. It's not our primary focus, but it is the outcome of actually truly fueling and taking care of your female body in a way that's aligned with basically how our body works and what it needs to thrive, especially through this age. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's, it's hard and we all start from different places too. So then mm -hmm. we have like that whole idea that, okay, we want to join a program or get support to see our goals through, where do we start? And even in my journey, I think a lot of people look at me now and I always kind of forget how I look now because there's still days when I look in the mirror and I still see the girl who is almost 200 pounds. I still see, I know in my heart that on my heart is the woman who was, or the young girl who was last on her cross country team. Like I don't look at myself and see someone who could run a three hour marathon or Boston qualify whenever I want to, or, you know, even the pictures on my website, I have people comment like, well, you don't look like me, so I don't want to be in your program. You don't know what it's like to be like me. And I'm sitting there thinking like, no, I've just, I'm on the other side now. And mm. I wish you were open enough to like, even hear what I had to say. I mean, just to like, I know so deeply where they're coming from. So I just think we make these assumptions sometimes and they don't always come from the best place, but they sometimes come with being unhappy with ourselves too. So I think this openness to, I don't know, just like being more open to accepting all sizes and shapes and women where they're starting from in their journey. Like we have such a wonderful community of women in our program. We are all different shapes and sizes and different levels of fitness passion. Maybe we are still running. Maybe we fell out of love with fitness and we're just got to get it back. And I do love that beautiful space. And I, I wish there was available for more women. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Louise. And I think about that too, because I've had clients make comments to me, you know, around, for instance, I went to see this client in person and she was like, well, aren't you a walking billboard for what you do? And in the back of my head, this woman actually happened to, you know, really be struggling with disordered eating and binge eating and self-loathing. And I'm like, well, I mean, I guess that's a compliment, <laughs> but if you knew my story, it took me 20 years of struggling and I've been 30, 40 pounds heavier. I've been binge eating in secret because of the shame and the pain and the trauma that I had experienced. And when you work so hard to get to the other side of that and you see the possibility of the relationship you can create with yourself and food and your body that is truly coming from a place of self-compassion, it's like, that's what we want all women to have. And that's what makes us so good and so passionate about what we do, because we have been on the other side. We can understand, we do relate. And even 
my one of my clients, she's down about 70 pounds now. And she said, you know, to be honest with you, when I first saw your picture, I'm like, what the hell is this girl ever going to help me with in regards to my relationship with food? And here we are seven months later, and she is on the most incredible journey of transformation. But it hasn't just been about the weight loss. It's the transformation that's been internal where now she has boundaries in her life. She knows like her vision of what she is willing and not willing to tolerate. She is happy. She's full of energy. She's vibrant. And so it's like, it's almost like that snowball effect from when we really start to prioritize our self-care, everything else in our life starts to transform. And I think that's what we we're, we are so much more than just helping women with running performance and body composition, because it is really just a prism, a reflection of all other areas that come into alignment when we truly prioritize self-love. Yeah. And prioritizing the self-love and self-care and wanting to feel our best, which yes. I think is the number one goal of every single person we coach. But the reality is, is I, and I even remember a story of a client where she went to a family gathering and she was getting scrutinized for the nutrition choices she was making as a part of being a part of our program. She was not eating some of the like normal dishes that the family had. And, you know, her mom was just like, Ugh, like, are you on some sort of diet? Like, what are you doing? Like, how, no, like you've really gone downhill. Like, what are you doing? And she was just, she was just like saying that she had an issue. And so she pulled her mom aside and she said, look, I'm actually really not feeling okay. There are things going on hormonally. I've recognized certain foods don't serve me right now. And this is showing up not about weight loss, not about anything else beyond the fact that I need to be able to get off the couch. I need to be able to be a good mom. I need to have a good marriage. I need to have stable mood. I cannot be crashing on the couch every day. I cannot be falling asleep at 7 p.m. Like that was how I was showing up in the world, mom. And that's, I don't want to feel that way. In fact, I refuse to feel that way anymore. And her mom for the first time was like, I get it. Because she related it to something that her mom could relate to, which was being a good mom. And so, yes, does she want the physique changes? Does she want to hit her goal time for running? Does she want everything? She does. But she took that moment of fit shame and what could have been really ugly. And she could have said, well, well maybe I should just eat the food. I'm so uncomfortable. Like Everyone in my family hates me. She was like, no. For the first time, I'm going to stand up for myself. And then she started getting comments at the next family function about her, how she was glowing, how she seemed so happy. She hadn't lost a single pound, but she just l was showing up as a different, more vibrant person a few weeks later. And had she listened to her family, she would have never had that moment of like, this is a new me. I'm not craving these foods. I don't feel like crap. My marriage is improving. I feel better in my body. My hormones feel amazing. I don't, I just want no woman to hold themselves back at the expense of somebody else's comment. Like, don't let other people do that to you. Uh, absolutely. And I love that example, Louise. And I think it touches on something that's so much deeper in the sense of like, these foods that we're consuming, these foods that we are encouraging our ladies to consume, they are the foods that are truly nourishing for us. They're the foods that give us the energy, the vitality, the micronutrients, the fibers, all of these bioactive components that are required for a healthy, strong, fit body. And yet what's so crazy is if she were walking around that barbecue, eating a bag of Cheetos and drinking Pepsi, nobody blinks an eye, but you walk around and you have a plate of vegetables and you turn down the ultra processed foods and all of a sudden you have a problem? Like, excuse me, I, I, I'm not sure how, how we ended up in this place, but I know for myself, I have a daughter and I know you have children too. And this isn't just about me. This is about me modeling a healthy relationship with food, the importance of connecting to where our food comes from, meaning prioritizing whole foods, cooking, giving my daughter the best nourishment possible, encouraging her to be active, encouraging her to be mindful, listen to her appetite, her, her hunger and satiety signals. I actually ask my daughter when she walks in and she wants a snack, I just say, sweetie, are you hungry? And she looks at me and she's like, you know, mom, I'm not, I'm just kind of bored. Well, 
how about we do something? How about we go for a walk? Because, you know, it's important to eat when our bodies are actually hungry. And these are the things I'm teaching her because I never want her to struggle the way that I struggled, the way my sister struggled, who unfortunately passed from an eating disorder, the way my mother struggled, the way her mother struggled. We have to start changing and shifting the relationship with food in our body that encompasses more than just how what what kind of food we're eating in the sense of what its impact is on our weight, but we're really missing how powerful these choices are in every aspect of our health. And that's that's a huge piece of that is the food industry not providing that education and information. And I know in our program, people like the ladies are pretty blown away when we start going into, I mean, look at the additives, the chemicals, all the other things that are a part of these foods that we're just not aware of because there is no education around that. You walk into the grocery store and uh, what is it? Frosted Flakes has healthy whole grain on it. I mean, what? What? I don't know what planet I'm on sometimes, Louise. <laughs> it's just craziness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it is amazing. The, the misleading marketing. I actually heard someone refer to that once as green labeling, where it's disguised as a healthy food. And they just like make it look like, hey, it's got whole grain and hey, look at all this fiber and, you know, seven grams of protein. But then there's like 80 grams of sugar. (laughs) (laughs) And meanwhile, our guidelines say limit sugar less than like 40 grams a day, which is still quite a bit of sugar. And then you go to the average, like what they serve at schools, just in the in the breakfast food, kids can get up to 100 grams of sugar. And then we're like, oh, but it's okay but that they have these behavior issues. Oh, they can't sit still. Oh, over 50% are overweight or obese. Oh, they have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease at 11 years old now. Oh, but I'm going to shame you for eating sweet potatoes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, um, we, get, we get a lot of comments in our current community about our kids just eating well. And they are thin. They are endurance athletes. And so like with our kids running and being in swimming, and then us eating well, most of the time they do have like lean, they're lean. And my son mm-hmm. does want to gain muscle. And we do talk about like being a healthy weight and how it's really important. But what's so interesting is I get the comment all the time. Oh, your kids are great athletes and so thin and fit because you and your husband, just total genetics. And every time that hits me so hard because if you look at breaking pictures of me and my husband, we are, we were the big bone kids. Like my, I, I should, I'm going to look the week of this podcast. I'm going to post pictures of us because my, I mean, my husband's got like two chins with a Cleveland Brown shirt with a beer and a beer helmet and a beer belly. And it, like, it's just, like, we have all been in that dark place of we are not genetically built the way that we are. We are a byproduct of what we have chosen, the, the life we have chosen. And our kids are not genetically like that either they're purely a product of their environment so i I just i cannot i cannot stand that and ladies who are being told that you are your genes you are not your genes express themselves based on what you give them whether or not they're turned on or off that goes for disease that goes for you know even if there were genes for alcoholism for obesity we can influence a lot not all the time 100 percent, but man I'm living proof that you do not have to be your genes in so many different ways. Ariel, you were going to say something. Oh my gosh. This just fires me up so much because I'm right there. I was like, quote, the big bone kid. And it's like, now people are like, wow, you're so fit. You're so in shape. And it's like, yeah, because of my habits. I mean, yes, I've had the genetic testing done just out of curiosity. And actually I was, I really dove deep into genetics about five years ago. And there are absolutely genes that can predispose people to all kinds of things, cancer, diabetes, obesity. But here is the thing. The environment is what pulls the trigger. I love that saying, genetics load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. So an example, yeah. So it's it's like, it's really the, what we call the epigenetics or that expression of the cell, which is determined by the environment. So something that's really interesting with like addiction They have shown now that with drug and food addiction, there are certain SNPs that predispose people to those addictions. But when the body is in an anti-inflammatory environment with adequate micronutrients, those genes are not expressed. And so 
I mean, that, God, that could be a whole nother podcast about how powerful food and inflammation is on people's propensity towards addiction. That's another story for another day. But I, I love what you're saying because, I mean, people look at my daughter and she's the same. She's very lean. She's very fit. And it's not because of her, quote, genes. It's because what do my daughter and I do after dinner? We take a walk together for 10 or 20 minutes and we talk about her day. We connect emotionally. I, you know, she follows my lead. She eats real food. Now, does that mean that my daughter never eats cupcakes or brownies? Absolutely not. But is that a foundation of her diet? Absolutely not. Yeah, I think there's just so much disempowering messaging. There are exceptional exceptions to every circumstance. Like I've worked in hospital systems where, or I've ran obesity, like fit camps for kids back in the day when I wasn't dietetics. And, you know, we saw individuals who were on terrible compounds of medication, which caused them to yes. gain weight. Like there's all sorts of extenuating circumstances, but the messaging around this from like that place of you, you can do so much. And it was interesting too, because even some of those kids would come up and they'd be like, Louise, I love this camp. Like I love exercise. Can you help teach my mom how to eat healthy? Because I feel so good right now. Oh, and then you go up to the parents and they're just like a almost pissed that their kids had to go to this camp and you could tell like oh my gosh like i i just like i i always left feeling so terrible because i was like that poor child wants to do so much for himself and then he doesn't have parents that support him and you know there's just all sorts of cir circumstances out there at all shapes and sizes for sure Absolutely. And I think, yeah, and of course, there's always going to be exceptions, like there's Prader-Willi syndrome. There are certain specific disease conditions that definitely predispose somebody to struggling more with their weight. But I think that's where we also have to stop with this, again, what you just were kind of alluding to, this narrow idea of like what a healthy fit body looks like instead of focusing on how somebody behaves, how they take care of themselves, and then whatever that weight is, we're not saying that people have to fit into a box. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that people will be the expression of their best self when they are taking care of themselves in all these other ways. And it's like I had this client, um, he gave me a call and he was like, what is this health at every size stuff? And I'm like, and he was just kind of going off on a tangent. And he was like, before I met you, he lost about 150 pounds with me. And he said, every time I stood up out of a chair, it was doing a one rep max. I was depressed. I would sit in my basement. I would eat. I had no zest for life. I have five kids. I wasn't involved in to the degree I want to because of how horrible I felt. He said, I am a new person. I feel good in my body, the energy I have, the vitality I have, my wife says you gave me my husband back and we're going to discourage this. Like that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I had a client once who said, before I met you, I was living to eat and now I'm eating to live. Yes. And I said, and he's like, I never thought that I'd shift my relationship with food that way. But when you educated me on how my body works, and what I should give it, that's all it took. And for most of the women that we coach too, it's more of the education piece. Like no one taught us how to work with our female body. And then if we do go to our doctors for help, we're told like we're fine, or, you know, this is just aging, welcome to the club. And that's just not okay. Like we have such an ill-informed medical system as well as even other nutrition and fitness practitioners out there. And I know as an example for me, for the first time in my life, when I really got healthy and fit and realized the power of food was when I was pregnant. It was the first time I shifted my mindset around what I was putting in my body was building a baby. So I know a lot of women are like, well, I would eat whatever during pregnancy. But for me, it was like, oh, no, like I need to take care of myself. And I think it's because it took me four years to get pregnant due to hormonal health challenges. So it was like, I need to do everything to keep this pregnancy. And I want to build the most beautiful baby because I don't know if my body can do it. You know, I was very worried, but I got in the best shape of my life while pregnant. And people would say to me, oh, you're so lucky. You're so lucky to be that fit while pregnant. And I'm like, no, it's my dedication <laughs> of going to the gym every single day to make sure that I have a strong, empowered labor. I am running to show that women can run safely and effectively through pregnancy. It's healthy for us because back like, you know, 12 years ago, 
people are still like, oh, you're running while pregnant. I'm like, no, the new research at the time supports that running while pregnant is absolutely fine. But even like going to my doctors and talking about symptoms and they're like, oh, you're the poster child of health. You're the poster child of health. And I'd be like, well, I'm doing everything that I can, but I still don't feel right. Turns out I had a high risk late, high risk pregnancy, gave birth six weeks early, and it was due to hormonal health challenges. But here, like doctors just kept writing it off. They're like, no, you're the poster child of health. Like, yes, from the outside looking in, I look extremely fit, but these are the symptoms I'm feeling. And it, so it was just the most, I mean, I, and then also to the fact that I'd worked so hard to get to that point of like meticulous self-care and was doing everything that I could. And then I had no one to help me. It was like mm -hmm. this. And then I was looked down upon for being so fit. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. this is not luck. Nothing about this is luck. <laughs> <laughs> You're being shamed for taking care of yourself and you're not being listened to. And what's so crazy is that if you were sitting there in McDonald's eating a Big Mac fries and a milkshake and you were pregnant, everyone would be like, oh, look at her. She's pregnant. And nobody would even blink an eye. And yet we know how toxic that food is and how what you eat during your pregnancy that's that's what's crazy is that i don't what what we eat during our pregnancy the environment that baby experiences predisposes that child to specific disease outcomes obesity insulin resistance etc and when we are adequately nourished while we're pregnant we are then going to set our child up for a life of struggle and it's just yeah, it's just it's just that again, that's that's again the irony, right? That you're being shamed for taking your health into your hands and actually being proactive versus if you just sat around eating potato chips and drinking milkshakes, it would nobody would bat an eye at that. Yeah. Yeah. And on an, another side of the spectrum, we're talking about like going to to doctors and like with perimenopausal symptoms, be like, oh, your lab work looks good enough or you're fit and healthy, you're exercising. Like even, even my husband will go to the doctor and be like, oh, you're great. You're exercising. You're doing all these things. He's like, no, I want to know like proactive things I can do. Or with the <laughs> coach who are having symptoms and they're like, I want to nip this in the butt now. And mm -hmm. like, I don't know how many women come into our program is like proactive preventive side too. Like I feel these things. I see my body composition changing. I not feeling like myself. What can I do about this now? And so I totally appreciate that. And I'm like, heck yes, girl, let's go. Let's educate you. Mm -hmm. So perimenopause is not a complete nightmare. And for those of us who it is, we've been there too. Like I saw it all the way through to all the menopause hell, <laughs> like bone loss, muscle loss, hot flashes, weight gain. I was there and I reversed it <laughs> or much of it, right? We can't reverse all of it. We are losing estrogen. Our hormones are declining, but let's protect the heck out of them, right? It's uh, to say that you can't do things about this is just, has to be my biggest pet peeve, probably. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that the, you know, unfortunately, though, that is just a reflection of so much of how medical care, or I don't know if I even call it care, <laughs> medical thought process, <laughs> medical treatment is really about, oh, here's the symptom. Oh, let me find the Band-Aid to give you. Instead of going, oh, where, what's the ideology there? What's the root cause? How can we actually shift this from, you know, a lifestyle perspective and take ownership and unlike you said, be proactive about our health and, you know, maintain that wellness and that vitality as long as possible. Yes. Yes. And that's actually a lot of what I'm sharing at this upcoming scientific conference. I'm sharing my story and how I, I did get into medical school and I didn't get the chance to go because I got into East Coast schools and my husband got stationed on the West Coast. And at the time I had my six month old son who it took me four years to get pregnant with. So my decision point was I'm either going to go to medical school on the East Coast and watch my son grow up on FaceTime in California, or I don't go to medical school and I move across the country to be with him. And I actually got my master's in public health program design and practice and was able to study whatever I wanted to in my online master's program, my research fellowships, practicums. And at the time I was struggling so much in my coming to come back to running, diastasis recti, my hips, my you know, brain fog, my hormone havoc. It turns out that I got all these diagnoses, like the premature menopause. And I was so stuck that I actually just went into the research and used my entire master's program to turn my health, fitness, and running breakdowns into breakthroughs. 
And what was interesting is I didn't, I went to my doctors and they're like, no, it's a lifetime of HRT, thousands of dollars in supplements. You know, mainstream medicine says medication, functional medicine says thousands in supplements. <laughs> and then others say, well, there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I don't accept that. So turning these, what we accept as normal health, fitness, and recreational running decline around with holistic food, stress management, lifestyle approach, training with our female physiology and not against it. And now I prevent that. Had I been a doctor, I, all I would have done was prescribe, diagnose, and treat. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was the best decision of my life. Like God knew my journey to not go to medical school because now I teach sports medicine providers in our program <laughs> to bring it full <laughs> circle for you. And they're like, this is the best program ever. I didn't learn anything in med school about nutrition, <laughs> you know, actually preventing these things. And they're like, we love you. And I'm like, I love you too. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that's what I love is like, it's such a beautiful community of inspiration and people lifting each other up and we're always learning. And I think the other thing that makes us so different is we're not cookie cutter. We're not about you do what I do. It's like, there is a foundation of principles, but then the method is really determined by the individual. And that's, that's where I think it's just so unique because I see so many practitioners out there who they have a way of what worked for them. And then that becomes like what they prescribe for everybody. And if it doesn't yeah. work for you, something's wrong with you. It's not them, something's wrong with you. I mean, a good example of this, I mean, I'm circling back a little bit to the beginning of the podcast, but there are probably some young runners out there who are dietitians who have groups and yeah, they can eat 500 grams of carbs a day and they don't gain weight and they feel good and they perform great. But you know what? I'm 43. That's not going to work. I'm going to feel like shit. My blood sugar is going to be all over the place. And I, you know, I, I think that's what drives me so crazy in this field, because one of the things that I think makes us so so different is that we're we're constantly questioning what we believe we're constantly refining our approach we're constantly diving into the latest research but we do utilize evidence but we are not evidence restrained we're evidence informed and we really do take that hybrid approach of taking the best of of both worlds in regards to yes the mainstream science but then also the functional and integrative and then marrying that with the right mindset and approach that really helps that person flourish because it's not about us ultimately. It's about us helping that person step into their best self because when we all tune out the world and we stop looking and start listening, that beautiful wisdom comes out and that's what we want to encourage because when you are in alignment with that, that's when everything just unfolds and you have this beautiful transformation. And one of the things I always think of is like the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. It's like, it's just, it, it doesn't, the reason I say transformation and not change is because when you transform, you don't revert back. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had a, um, that just reminds me of a boyfriend who I dated for like years and years and years. And he was with me through the struggle of just my hormonal health and my youth and being overweight and trying so hard. And he like really wanted to help me. And we were just like, so stuck. And he just said, Louise, I know that he's like, I just picture you as like this blossom, like this little like seed. And one day you are going to bloom. And when you bloom, like, I cannot wait for the world to see you. He's like, but right now you're just like staying in that shell and I don't know how to help you bloom. And I'm like, and I don't know how to help myself. And, and I think of myself now and I think of where I'm at and it's like, I don't even talk to that person anymore because we dated for so long that we just had to completely go our separate ways. But I just think of like, here I am now, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the blossom version of me. <laughs> and I want every woman to not stay in that little shell and to find the people who are going to tell you like, bloom, freaking bloom, girl. <laughs> like, it's <your> time. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that was so beautiful. I'm like getting teary eyed just like when you were explaining that because that is so much of what we like. Oh my gosh, I'm getting, I'm actually getting emotional here. Yeah, I, I know, I know. But it's, 
It's oh. just so, because that's what we are trying to bring to the world is like, we want other women. Like you don't have to be in that place of shame. You don't have to struggle with your body. There is this, just this, this whole other experience on the other side. And yes, it's, it takes hard work. It takes discipline. But when that all comes from a true place of self-compassion, the transformation is inevitable and everybody can, anybody can do it. It is not, we are not special, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, it's in, and I think that's what drives us is we, you know, we know what it's like to feel disempowered. We know what it's like to feel this level of shame and not wanting to put ourselves out there and feeling like something is wrong with us. And when you really are able to break through that, you want to bring as many people as possible with you because it is not a fun place to be. And that energy translates into every aspect of our lives. And, you know, I even see where it's like my final breakthrough led me to, I believe it was divine design to land with you, Louise, because you were like the icing on the cake. I mean, you helped me make that last breakthrough within myself that it's like, there ain't no going back. I have found my tribe and I am ready. And it was just like, it just makes me it, I already have passion, but it, man, this fire is going strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's what I love. Like, I know that when we talk to the women that we're talking to with this podcast, the ones who are reaching out and saying, I freaking love this. You're describing me. Like I see you and me and you get me. And, and it's not about the sale. It's not about like the income at this point. It is about the mission. And, you know, I lowered the price of my program. I sliced it by like 75%. Because I realized when I was charging like $7,000 for a program, I was not serving the people I wanted to serve. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want this to be some luxury program. Like, this is for everyday women who are struggling, who don't feel like themselves, who want to do something about it. And I even say like in my little welcome email, when you opt into our newsletter, it's like, this is, can you imagine when someone gets you and then they give you the strategy specific to you? And we already get that you're highly motivated. You just need to know the right things to do. And I think that's why this program gets such amazing results. Like they are truly industry leading results at this point. I'm presenting them at a freaking international conference this weekend. Like it's insane, but it's because of all the things that I've been held back on. Like I share about how I created an entire injury prevention program for a major, we'll call it a company based on the latest cutting edge science. And I was trying to bring the research to practice as fast as humanly possible. And it sat on a desk for no one ever to acknowledge it. And I actually share this story in my presentation about how now, look at the stats of our running injuries. One running related injury, possibly two, I can remember off the top of my head, in four years. So that young female scientists, program that sat on a freaking desk in a research lab that no one acknowledged because I was brand new is now providing industry leading outcomes for everyday recreational runners who don't want to be freaking injured. Women are reversing their injuries or ditching them after years of working with other practitioners, chiropractors, physical therapists. And they're like, Louise, it took me two months. I'm like, I know it's crazy when you understand strength and conditioning and human physiology, what you can do. You know, it's like, I can attest to that, Louise. <laughs> Thanks to you, my hamstring issue, which was not a result of our work together, but an old injury I had. I mean, because, you know, of your, your coaching and helping me through that, I am now running again and feeling amazing and my leg is recovering. And yeah, I just think that that's just another example of what's so incredible about bringing what has been a struggle and making that like a service and bringing light to an industry that is just clouded with so much misinformation and so much darkness and so many women that have that they are good gooders, but they're climbing the wrong mountain. They're listening to practitioners who are not listening to them. And that's what's so infuriating is like, we are here to listen to you. It is not about what we want for you. It's about what you want for you. And then we're going to help you get there. Yeah. Yeah. And someone who actually cares. And, you know, if mm -hmm. you are part of another program or you're working with other practitioners, I just encourage you to find the person who genuinely cares, 
who will take the time to listen to you. Because this current system that we are in where people get like 15 minutes of time with you, it's just unacceptable. Or they're charging hundreds of thousands of dollars when they are, air quotes, getting to know you holistically. And then it's just like, well, here's other things you can buy and more packages. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I can't <laughs> stand it. It is the worst. It is the absolute worst. <laughs> oh, it's like, I know I touched on this in another episode, but it still gets me that that woman with that over $3,000, you know, program, and you don't even get one one on one session with her. And as a practitioner myself, and as you being a practitioner, we know the relationship that we are building with our clients cannot happen through digital. Like we have to like connect, we have to yeah. have conversation. We don't say go watch this module. See you later. We'll have a group Q and a later on. It's like, no, we are holding your hand through the process. We are working with you one on one. But I think that's what's so sad about all these quote signature programs in this online space is a lot of them are built on a foundation of how can I make the most money with the least amount of time invested. And that is I mean, that would be so soul sucking for me like to not know how my client is doing, not be there to guide them and coach them through all the nuance and context that they need in order to truly make the program work for them. But that's what a lot of these programs are because these practitioners can then, they don't care, they can sign up thousands of people because if they don't have any one-on-one -on -one time with you, they're basically detached from whether or not you get where you wanna go, whereas our whole intention and our whole focus is getting where you wanna go. <laughs> Yeah. And in order to do that, we have to have that connection. We have to build that relationship. We have to have that one on one time. And that's why we have the community support and we have the check ins and we have the Q and A's because we are not going to leave you there to flounder with just, oh, here's your educational materials. See you later. Good luck. You know, right. Well, even with like submitting your client intake form in your two day food log and we have the 30 minute consult with you beforehand. And I'm like, so I need 72 hours with your materials before we have our first session. And they're always like, wait, three days? I'm like, I take a lot of time to reflect on what mm -hmm. you told me, to look at root causes in your food log, to take into consideration your health history, how much you're working out, what are you eating, you know, all of these different things you've told me about yourself. And like even the other day, we had a client who for within her world, she was like in a crisis and she was feeling some symptoms. And in the middle of our day, work day, I call Ariel and I'm like, hey. I need to take a look at this food log with me. Like, I think we need to give her something today. She's not going to be okay. And we spent, I don't know, like an hour and a half giving this client like tangible, like eight bullet points she could focus on because she was feeling terrible. We've been there. We know what it's like. And so, I mean, as the program grows, will we always have the luxury of doing it that day? Maybe not. But that's the type of care we want to provide. And we know our limits as practitioners and the number of people we can bring on. And I think our whole point here is just recognizing like when you're highly motivated, when you want to see these changes, when you're feeling this crap and you're like, what the hell is happening in my body? This came out of nowhere. Yes, you can do about something about it. And when you find the right practitioner who will help you take your hand and say, I've been there, girl, and I will not let you fall. Like you might stumble, but I'm going to pick you up as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> like that is what we want for every listener of this podcast to have that person to have that community. And when you find it, especially the stage of life, oh, it's amazing. So whether that's your running crew, whether that's your you, you do need that support in your nutrition, your fitness, your program design, find that person for sure. Uh, Ariel, yeah, did and you have any other? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead <laughs> we're both so excited <laughs> it's like well i i just think you know that that leads right back to you know the fish shaming what we were discussing about you know this what it what that all encompasses i mean if you are taking those steps to truly better yourself and you are dealing with comments from other people it's really remembering that um whenever somebody has an opinion a judgment a criticism a comment about you it's always a reflection of themselves if you if somebody is triggered by something you are doing and they feel the need to tear you down in some way or fashion it's 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 not about you you're just a reflection for them of what they have not yet had maybe the courage to do or maybe they don't believe they can do and so it's 
letting go of that, not taking it personally and understanding that that's just not about you. I mean, it's like that book, The Four Agreements. And one of the agreements is, you know, basically anybody's opinion about you is nothing about you. It's about them. And and when you can really embody that and realize that if we continue to live for what other people expect of us or worrying about what other people think, we're never going to be stepping into our power and we're never going to be living our best life. Yeah, absolutely. Focusing on loving ourselves. I think that's a great call to action is just focusing on that self-love, loving who you are becoming and focusing on that with like laser focus and others comments that ability to just own it in the stage of life. We all need that confidence. We all need to step into that. I'm trying every day to just like, I know, I know myself, I know these methods that I've created. I see the results they're bringing for women. And even when I feel shamed for things in the industry or I go online and I'm like, Ooh, second guessing myself or dang, she's got a lot of, you know, there's just a lot of things that I see is like, no, like my highest self is, is right here right now in my work. So, and that's a journey of self-love too, just physically in my body. And once I accepted that and I stopped listening to what others said and just saw my journey, it was life-changing. Oh, I love that. I love that, Louise. And it, it's like what um, a client told me this morning and she's been on this journey for like probably about four months now. And she said, oh, I have to tell you this quote I put on my refrigerator. And she said, Discipline is the strongest form of self-love. It's ignoring something you want right now for something later on. The future you is depending on the current you to keep promises you made to yourself yesterday. And with the fit shaming, it's like, <laughs> don't take advice from people who aren't living the life that you want to live. If, is this person that I want to take advice from, if I switch shoes with them, would that be the life I want to live? I mean, these are some good questions if you do, if you are experiencing these comments from friends or family and don't take criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from. <laughs> I think that's, yeah. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a community of women empowering women finding that, mm -hmm. like finding a few people that just get you. And I know many of the women that we have, they feel like that in our community. Like I've had women say that I've come from other group coaching programs and I felt so put down for wanting more, for wanting to be a runner who had like a fit body and was a healthy weight. And when I gained some, I was really uncomfortable and I hated it. And then I was told that, no, I should only feel my body to perform. And it was like the worst. And I feel so validated. And at the same time, she like the women have shared that they felt so frustrated that they put up with that for so long. So if you need to like release some of this and just question some of this messaging you've been told, maybe you did start to shift your mindset and you don't feel like yourself as a result. It's OK if you have a different vision. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we encourage that. And we just encourage you to reflect on what is the vision you have for yourself? And how does that feel at your core? And that whatever that is, that's right for you. And we're here to help you build that. And we're not here to tell you that you don't have a right to want to feel good in your body. And there, the, the reality is that when we feel like when we feel good in our body and when we look good, that does translate into confidence, empowerment and success in so many arenas. Yeah, I, I always encourage I used to have a little workshop where I talked about next level you and we think of next level to ourselves like 10 pounds or I want to fit into this gene size or I want to run this time with running and it's like, what does that achieving that marathon time goal, what's that ripple mm. effect in your life? How do you feel when you lose 10 pounds? Because it's not about the actual weight. It's not about the marathon time. It's about who you become as a result of achieving your goals and to not lose sight of that because that ripple effect, when you look amazing presenting in your job and you feel so confident, 
It empowers you to make a healthy lunch decision. You, you go home and you feel vibrantly well. You connect with your kid. You have energy. You connect at the dinner table. You connect with your husband in the bedroom and you can actually feel it. That is the <laughs> ripple effect that we want Amen. you to achieve. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I think that is like that, that, oh, I love that because that, that just keys into exactly. It's, it's like, we keep looking at these behaviors instead of looking at what is the energy underneath it. When you are choosing to meal prep, to make sure you don't grab something fast food later, that's taking care of yourself. That's an energy of self-care and love. And for that to be shamed is so sad, you know? And it's like, like you were just saying, Louise, it's like, let's look at these goals you have. Are these goals coming from a place of self-care or self-loathing? It's not as much about the behavior as it is about what is the energy underneath. And if that energy underneath is really coming from a place of love and passion, then that's what we want to fuel. That's what we want to feed. Because I I don't know about you, Louise, but I have never sat down with a half gallon of ice cream in a good place with myself. I mean, that's just, <laughs> no. sorry, just hasn't happened. Yeah. I have never chosen to skip the gym because I feel so good about myself. I have never, <laughs> just like, you know, I mean, I, I, we all have the same 24 hours in the day and I've had people like, oh my God, you get up at 4.30 in the morning or you get up at 5 a.m. I could never do that. And I'm like, okay, that's that's fine. I could never spend three hours a day on TikTok. I mean, that's just, yeah. I, we, I, I make this choice because I know that when I make that decision to get out of bed and do something I don't always really feel like doing, but know is in the best interest of my mind, body, and spirit, that snowballs into every other decision I make that day just compounding these positive behaviors versus hitting that snooze button and going, oh, I don't feel like it. Oh, I think I'm going to drag myself and grab some coffee. Oh, I'm, I think I'm just going to get an egg McMuffin on the way to work. I mean, it's like, you know, it's the same yeah. thing. It's that energy of activation and, and those, those habits and behaviors that we build, they truly do then build a foundation of, of whatever we are trying to create. You know, it's that one decision that we can make. And I'm not saying everybody has to get up at 4 or 5 a.m. <laughs> that's what I like to do. Um, but if that's not the decision that you want to make, I can respect that. So let's let's figure out what's going to work for you to also be able to build that life that you want to step into. Yeah, and I, I bet a lot of podcast listeners can resonate this, but I know a lot of us work out early in the morning. And you know, even when I would get up early and I would go to the gym, let's say postpartum, and I would take time away from my baby. I don't know about the listeners of the podcast, but I would get so many comments on the fact that I was taking time away to go exercise. Or as an example, I'll go home for the holidays and you know the expectation is to stay there the whole entire time, like the whole week. And I take time every single day to go for a run or go to the gym. And I get comments on it. Like, oh, taking time away to go to the gym? again every day and for me i go to the gym so i don't need to pop antidepressant it's my endorphin hit otherwise i'm not going to be okay it's my stable mood it's me coming back and accepting and loving every single person in this family when they're judging the hell out of me <laughs> like you know <laughs> like it's, and then it's like i come home and i have a nourishing meal and it's like we're not gonna have that and like not all the treats all the time like yes i'll have some but i mean my goodness that why? Why are we judging these habits that are helping us hold on to ourselves, to be our best self, to not need all the medication, to not, you know, it's just, and if we have to have medications, there's the time and a place for it. But in the instance of mental health, like exercise is medicine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I love that you said that because there was this, there was this reel on Instagram the other day that somebody sent me and I, I just love it. It said, I'd rather be uncomfortable for 45 minutes a day than uncomfortable in my body for the rest of my life. Yep. And I read that and I was like, amen. I mean, it's like, it's yes. just like choose, choose what's important to you. And, you know, and again, it's like, you know, it's really letting go of 
anybody else's judgments or opinions. I mean, this is this is our body. The relationship that we have with our body is the most intimate relationship that we that we have. And for anybody else to have an opinion or judgment about what that is supposed to look like is just completely asinine. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't walk around and tell people they get off their ass and go to the gym because they don't work out. I can't believe you don't work out. Or I can't believe you're feeding that to your kids. Like I would never make comments like that because I yeah. know it's so much deeper than that. And it's not my place to judge or have an opinion about how other people eat or move or take care of themselves. I'm just here to be an inspiration and a guide so that women don't have to suffer the way that I did and the way that you did. And, you know, there, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's, it's the, the way of the world now. It's, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> yes. So to our listener, we encourage you to rise above fit shaving, love yourself, focus on next level you stepping into your highest potential. You have every right to do it. You deserve it. If you need support along the way, you know where to find us at breakingthroughwellness.com. We got your back, girl. So does our community. We will all rise above fit shaming together on either end of the spectrum. Let's not put down individuals or judge them for their crazy decisions that we, we think as health and fitness nuts is crazy. The crazy in me accepts the crazy in you. And let's just rise above fit shaming once and for all. So with that, ladies, we are wishing you a vibrantly energized, healthy, and high-performance journey ahead. Take care. And of course, your friendly medical disclaimer. No information on this podcast or provided through any of our services should be used to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure any disease or condition. Please always seek the advice of a trusted medical professional, such as your doctor, as needed. We are collaborative here at Breaking Through Your Wellness as an active member of your team when we work in one-on-one -on -one coaching services only. With that, we are wishing you a vibrant, healthy, and high-performance day, finding all the information you need to unlock your best with less stress.